the continuation of our Teller UI webinars, uh, we're going to get in some live coding uh, demos here uh, in just a second. Um, my name is Ed Charbonneau. I'm a developer advocate for progress, uh, the makers of the Telerik UI components. Um, we just had a, an hour of an overview of uh, all of the Telerik UI libraries for the web. We covered Ajax, uh, MVC, Core, and uh, Blazor, talked about what's new. Uh, we're going to change things up a little bit, though. We're going to jump over to Visual Studio this time. Um, I'm going to work on code live. Uh, so there may be things that fail. Maybe things will be great. But we're going to look at some of the new bits that we have available for Blazor. We'll look at uh, some of the ways to get started. Um, we'll dig into an existing like full stack application. Uh, so that should leave plenty of opportunity uh, for folks to ask questions. That's what this forum is for. So please jump in on chat here on Twitch and ask away while you have me live to answer questions uh, to the best of my abilities. Again, this is live, so uh, we may be looking things up for answers. Who knows? All right, uh, let's see here. And of course, in chat at any time, um, if you cannot see or hear something, please let me know right away and I'll try my best to fix it. Um, probably be best if I am full screen, although I will toggle back so uh, you can see there's human being here every once in a while, uh, just to let you know I am here. All right, let's take a look at some of the new stuff that came in uh, on this release. One of the things I wanna share is uh, probably something that's, that's frequently overlooked, and that is tooling that goes along with the Blazor components that we produce and, and some of the other UI components as well. Um, we actually have installers that handle a lot of these plugins for you. Um, if you do not see these plugins, I'll show you where to get them in just a second. But what I want to start with is uh, create new project here. Uh, so in my Visual Studio, you'll see I have uh, Telerik C Sharp Blazor application. Uh, that is a template that I've installed uh, with the Telerik UI bits. Um, I also have the Telerik UI for ASP.NET Core MVC applications in here. Um, we're going to try to focus on Blazor today unless somebody's got a specific question uh, about uh, MVC or Core. I might pivot over to that for a minute. Uh, but I'm going to look at the Telerik UI uh, for Blazor application template and then click Next. Uh, name of the application isn't going to matter too much. Probably going to end up deleting this later anyway. Uh, it's just to kind of showcase what this template can do. Uh, we'll give it the obligatory hello world uh, name here. We'll go ahead and click create. Uh, after we hit create, this is a custom dialogue that you're going to see uh, with our tooling. Uh, we have a kind of kitchen sink demo that comes with this. Uh, this is the CRUD form uh, and chart in server app. We also have a client WebAssembly version of this as well. So we support uh, Blazor on the server as well as Blazor on WebAssembly, uh, which is nice. Uh, let me adjust my screens over here so I can see chat a little bit better just in case uh, some stuff comes up. Hey, Curious Drive, welcome to the show. Uh, we're just digging into some uh, some of the project templates. And again, I'll show you where to get these in just a second. Um, I just want to kind of give an overview of each one and what they do. Actually, uh, let's use a little little Zoom technology here. And in the top section, you'll see all these are server app. So these are all server-side Blazor templates. These are all client-side Blazor templates. But essentially, the top and bottom are the same templates. They just run in different contexts. Uh, this center column here is kind of that kitchen sink demo I was talking about. And then we added this brand new dashboard uh, project as well. Uh, so we're going to look at the dashboard project. Um, we can pivot over and look at this too. Uh, the Actually, let's, let's dive into the CRUD, op, uh, the CRUD uh, example first, because uh, that has a lot of uh, technology in it that we can kind of get a brief overview of what all is in there. Uh, so I did find a new project. It's up and running. I'll hit Control F5, and we'll take a tour of everything that's in here real fast. And then we'll look at the brand new uh, template that was added that has the dashboard application. So that's a good one. 
All right, uh, so this template, when you do file new project, it gives you a lot of examples out of the box. It also gives you a lot of nice, useful links on the right-hand side here. So um, I highly suggest you take a look at this project just for the links alone, uh, because you can easily jump over to the links and then come back to the project and try things out. So that's fun. Um, this is actually a window component that you're seeing uh, right here. It says about this template. This is a window. If I click on the little X on the side, uh, this is a Telerik window that we can open and close. Um, there's also on this page a nice little, uh, I don't want to call it Easter egg. It's not hidden completely. It's, it's kind of nuanced though. If you click on more info, this is actually an animation container uh, that uh, is a, a nice component that allows you to do animations with Telerik UI for Blazor. Uh, so that, that's a little hidden gem right there, I think. Uh, so you can get an idea of how that works. Um, we also have a data grid example, and uh, there's a menu example. So this is our, our menu up here at the top um, that we can use to navigate. We can also navigate by link here in the center. If we click on grid, we have a nice data grid example, and this one has CRUD operations, so we can actually go in here and edit items and change uh, some of the values in there as well. And uh, notice the nice data binding that's happening here. Like when I change the temperature in Fahrenheit, it actually changes the temperature in Celsius as well. So it keeps those two fields updated. And I can click update and make that change and apply it. We can also delete those records. Uh, we can export this to an Excel file. Uh, then we can add brand new items right here in line. Uh, so there's a lot of features just right here in the grid example. And all the code for that is right in that template. Um, we have some chart demos in here as well. So you can see how to render out some chart data, uh, put two series on a graph. Uh, so that's uh, nice to have. And then of course, what application wouldn't be complete without forms. So we have some uh, form inputs that you can use here too. And then the rest of the links up here go out to the web for things like documentation, uh, other live demos, and our theme builder, of course, which would allow you to theme the entire demo app that you see here. So that's one of the first uh, demos um, or templates that we offer from that file new new project experience. So let's look at another one. We'll do uh, file new project again. And again, I'm gonna select Telerik C Sharp Blazor application. I promise I'll get to uh, where to get these if you don't have them installed already. Uh, we'll do hello WASM this time. So WebAssembly. Um, or we did WebAssembly before. We'll do Hello Dashboard. We haven't covered that yet. Um, so we do a dashboard, and we'll take a look at this. This is our dashboard template. Again, server and client uh, both supported. Uh, we'll go ahead and click on that one. And hit Control F5. And when this one loads up, and it, it's loading up off screen, in case you're wondering. Uh, that's popping up on my other screen. It always seems to want to go there. Uh, but this allows you to create those dashboard, drag and drop uh, type of scenarios. Uh, so this is all built in uh, to the template where you can easily get started and um, get an idea of how that, um, that tile layout works. So I'm going to jump over to the code here, and we'll take a look where that page is. We go under Pages, and we look at index.razor. This was all just templated out for us uh, with that file new project. Um, and you can see the Telerik tile layout is here, and it has all of the components that are being shown, the little charts and gauges and graphs and things that are on there. It's not a whole lot of code. There's maybe 100 lines and markup and logic here. Um, but it's a nice getting started experience. And all the uh, all the dependencies and everything that are necessary for a Teller application are already preloaded in there. Uh, so if you don't have this extension, here's what it takes to get it. Um, first of all, you need to have a Teller account. Uh, so go to Telerik.com, grab a free trial. If you use the the uh, Telerik installer, you should get a prompt uh, for that. Um, 
that integration. Um, I can show you what that looks like in the progress control panel. Um, this is one of our install experiences here, the progress control panel. Uh, this lets you manage all of your uh, Telerik products uh, in one convenient place. It's super handy, especially when updates come out. Um, you'll see this update all button that you can just click here. Uh, but when you install the, um, the Telerik UI for Blazor, you'll have a checkbox in here that comes up and, and um, you can check off the versions of Visual Studio you want to add that tooling to. Uh, so make sure you do that. If you still don't see it for some reason, you can also come into your extensions and click on manage ex extensions and you can find that um, uh, set of templates on the Visual Studio Marketplace if you search for uh, Telerik there. Uh, you'll find a lot of templates. There is the one with the highlighted check mark here, uh, which is, oh, that's ASP.NET Core. We should have a, the uh, Blazor one listed in here as well. There it is. So there's the Progress Telerik UI for Blazor extension. If it's not showing up in Visual Studio for some reason or another, make sure you go out and install it there. So you can grab it um, and have those nice templates available. So uh, this is one of the things that I like to get started with because it, um, it doesn't require you to manually add anything to your project to get started. But there is a third way. If you do file new project and you have a standard Blazor app, I'm just going to create a standard Microsoft templated Blazor app. Um, I'm going to easily convert this to a Blazor, Telerik UI for Blazor application. Uh, with a nice um, little piece of tooling that we offer. Uh, so I'll click through, create a new Blazor WebAssembly app. And um, you can see this is the typical uh, Blazor application here. You've probably seen this a million times with the counter component and uh, the fetch data example. So we can turn that very quickly into a Telerik application. Um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to click on Extensions, Telerik, uh, Telerik UI for Blazor, um, Convert to Telerik Application. And when I click on that, I get a nice wizard here that comes up. Um, I can select the version of Telerik UI for Blazor I want to uh, target. I can create a backup of my app. This is, I'm going to throw this away when I'm done. I don't need to create a backup of it. So I'm going to choose to not make that backup. And then I'll hit Next. And congratulations, your app is now converted to a Telerik UI for Blazor application. What does that actually mean, though? Well, let's take a look. We've got this page that has this fetch data example. It's got this nice data table. I say data table because it's not a data grid. A grid has more features. We have filtering, sorting, paging capabilities in a grid. This is just a table. It's just outputting some data to the screen. And actually, the markup for that is kind of verbose. Let's go take a look. So this fetch data example, um, it's just iterating over some standard HTML elements to render out uh, that um, HTML data table. Let's replace this with a Telerik grid since we just converted it to a Telerik UI for Blazor application. Uh, what I can do here is say Telerik uh, grid and notice I automatically have IntelliSense because that wizard added all the dependencies uh, to the project already for me. Um, I'm going to bind some data to this. So I'm going to say data equals forecasts which is the same uh, set of data that the, the HTML table was binding to. And then I don't have to do anything else with this. I just need to tell it that I want to auto-generate some columns here so it knows where to find those column names. And then when I refresh the application and go back to fetch data, and again, this is live streaming at best. Something has failed. Uh, let's take a look and see uh, what exactly is going on here. I've got a 404, um, so there is some resource missing. 
So let me back out of this real quick. Maybe the wizard missed something. I'm not sure. <laughs> CSS usually. Let's take a look. Um, so in our main layout or our, uh, let's see here, our It'd be in our index HTML in this case. Um, it looks like one of our uh, files is missing. Not sure which one it's complaining about here. Uh, let's see. This might be something the team should look into if um, if there was a change in the way uh, the resources are as well. It could be. Um, let me double check something really quick here. Let me make sure there, there's not a caching issue. Doesn't seem to be. Uh, let's see, could not find Telic Blazer. It looks like it's missing, um, it's missing some of the client side dependencies here. Let me check, um, Remove the defer attribute. All right, looks like we need to update uh, the wizard a little bit if it's got something in it that is. Again, this is what live streaming gets you folks. This worked for me the other day and now it's not gonna work today. Um, let me double check here. All right, so let me double check one of our examples that we just did. So we'll, we'll drop back over to uh, the previous example. Um, this is an experience I've not had with the converter before, but of course on a, on a live show, it's gonna catch me. So it's trying to keep me on my toes today. So we'll, we'll start up an, another Blazor application. Uh, we'll look at the one that we just did that worked uh, perfectly fine. Um, we just had, where did it go? We had a Hello World app that worked good. There we go. So we'll do Hello Dashboard again, and we'll just do a quick comparison here and see uh, what exactly we missed. It, the, the little uh, bug here has taken the magic out of the, the demo. Uh, let's just double check. The strips are loading fine here, so I'm wondering if there's another issue at hand. Let's double check this one. This one works perfectly fine. We can see our dashboard is up and running. So why is our converted app not happy? What happened with our converted app? Let's paste this code in and compare notes here. And those lines of code look the same to me. I don't think it is... Um, Not sure why it's doing what it's doing. Oh, let me let me double check something really fast here. Uh, it could be that for some reason it's using our Telerik layout. All right, I'm gonna abandon that demo. We will have to have our support folks look at that and see uh, what's going on there. I don't want to drag out the time of the show troubleshooting why javascript works in one app and not another uh, there is a javascript dependency by blazor it looks like uh, either the framework dependency or the library dependency is not loading for that one so let's move on to uh, something a little more integrated um, did nuget restore properly oh you know what let's double check that real fast Sorry, I didn't see the comment come in there. Uh, that's actually a good thing we could check, and then we can 
move on. After I did the uh, wizard, let's try, let, let's actually start that over again. Let's try that one more time. We'll create a new Blazor app. Uh, we'll just throw away app 24 here. Click on create. It's something I do very regularly, and now when I do it live, it's going to catch me with some oddity that I've never seen before. We'll convert the app, we'll throw away the backup, and we'll click finish. Uh, let's try doing a full restore here. Let's do a re clean solution. We'll rebuild it. This uh, chat said that I was missing a, a dependency uh, when it loaded. So we'll try that. We'll go to pages, fetch data, and we should be able to put on this page a brand new teller at grid. We'll put the forecast data collection and auto complete the columns. There's about four steps it takes to add uh, Telerik UI to uh, an applicant. There it goes. Uh, so there was uh, something didn't restore properly. Uh, so just enough to uh, keep me on my toes during a live stream. Uh, so we added uh, with the wizard uh, the Telerik UI libraries. Whew, thank you, that worked finally. Um, there looks like the clean and restore process solved that problem for us. Uh, so the, the template is working fine. Thanks, support. Uh, it is working perfect. Um, now all we need to do is drop in that Teller grid. And now, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, this is more than an HTML table. So while it looked pretty similar uh, to begin with, we'll create a little room here. And now we can say uh, sorting uh, is true. Uh, paging is true and now we can just add all these features by just enabling properties on the component which is nice uh, so paging sorting we'll add some filters to it uh, uh, let's see the filter mode is going to be uh, a telerik uh, oh, sorry a grid filter mode uh, and then we have a choice of how we would like to display that filter mode. So now I'll refresh that page and we'll take another look at it. And we've gone from a data table to a data grid with paging, sorting, and filtering. And uh, we can sort these items. We can easily click on our filter. Uh, see if it's equal to 14, we'll go ahead and filter that item out. And we've got all that functionality just by changing this to uh, a Teller grid and enabling a couple of properties on it. And notice the amount of code that was initially there is now shrunk pretty heavily. Uh, one of the other nice thing, things about um, this versus iterating over uh, your own HTML is uh, you notice when I had this before, I had an at if uh, forecast is null, say, loading. Uh, I don't need to do that with the grid. That functionality is also built in. So I don't need to check to see if my data is empty. Um, it's going to handle that for me. Uh, so it, when the, the data is asynchronously loading into the grid, you don't have to double check and make sure that it's it's empty and, and handle that null scenario uh, like we did with the HTML part of it. So just regular razor. Um, while very helpful and capable, uh, this is a lot nicer and more, um, more compact uh, to write our code this way. And that's just a few of the basic Teller grid capabilities right there. Um, I'm going to go to a much larger project and show you some more things that it can do. So I've been working on a project for quite some time and uh, it's got quite a bit of uh, functionality here. Uh, we've got a question here too. Uh, can I show a spinner while loading data? Absolutely. Um, you can show spinners while loading data. Um, matter of fact, 
do we have that uh, demo up on our website? I believe we do. Demos.teller.com, um, Blazor Grid. Uh, let's see. I'm pretty sure we have a loading. It might be in our virtualization. Nope. Um, it is possible, and I thought we had something in here already baked. Um, yeah, Curious Drive, we're going to jump over to the Blazing Coffee app. Oh, we don't have animation load. Uh, so it looks like if um, you could vote that up. We, we don't have the loading animation for the grid by default. Um, there is a loading, uh, kind of a loading graphic that shows with virtualization. You can see it. It's kind of hard to see unless I really spin this hard. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a loading uh, animation that happens with virtualization, which is a feature. Column and row virtualization are baked into the grid as well. Uh, so while there's not a spinner per se, um, there, there is some loading capabilities there. Uh, let's jump over to another application demo. So this is like a fully featured um, app that we can look at. Uh, let's go to presentation mode again. And I have my Blazing Coffee app. This is a personal project of mine. It hopefully will become a um, official Telerik um, demo, but uh, it's not the officially supported demos that you'll find on our site quite yet. It's uh, kind of a work in progress still, mainly because I keep adding things to it. That's kind of on me. I, I like to uh, uh, dog food all of our stuff and play uh, with all of the bits. Um, so this is the latest and greatest version of that uh, application. So this app is about as featureful as uh, I think you're going to get. Um, this is an app that has every feature that I could imagine baked into it until the latest release. I haven't started working with uh, the new bits that you all saw today during the webinar. Um, I've been playing with all of this stuff, but um, it's time to add some of the brand new one, uh, 2.17 uh, stuff in here. So one of the things I want to look at today, we didn't get any time in the webinar for it, is I want to turn on some of these new column features that we added. So if I go to my demos.telerik.com, um, I have, let's see, where is this? Column menus were added. You can see the green badge right here uh, for the column menus. And I talked about it so briefly in the webinar, I did not give it enough time. Uh, it's so hard to fit everything into an hour when you have four major .NET uh, web frameworks to talk about in an hour segment, uh, plus some housekeeping things. Uh, so this, this is something I want to add to my app today, uh, definitely. Um, so these let you control uh, sorting, and what columns are visible, uh, and also filtering for a given column. Uh, so if I click on columns here, you'll see uh, that I can turn on and off certain columns in the data set. Um, I can also filter uh, right here. Uh, so this one, um, one interface here takes place of uh, many different functionalities. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so this is something that I'd like to look at. So in our online demos, we have really good examples. If you click on view source, you can kind of get an idea of how uh, these menu items are added. And in this one, it's going to be as simple, I believe, is adding this show column menu is true. Uh, so let's take a look at our Blazor application. This is something, again, I've been building for quite some time, so there, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on here. And if you have questions, you want to know how a certain feature here works, uh, let me know. And uh, I'll try to dig in a little bit as we, we, we um, check out these new features for Telerik UI for Blazor. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is uh, this app has full authentication. So I can log into the app 
And I'm going to click Login. My, it already remembers my credentials thanks to Chrome. I'll go ahead and click uh, through that. And notice it grabs my photo. Um, this is just a really simple integration with Gravatar. So uh, Blazor can make calls out to third-party services uh, really easy. So I'm just pulling a Gravatar image in here uh, and putting that in um, the panel over here. This is a Telerik drawer component. Uh, so it's it's highly customized, but it's showing uh, navigation for the application and my login information. And in this, I have a couple different um, demos of uh, reports and different data grids. And this one in particular, I think, is where I want to try adding that new feature. So I have filtering enabled here, and I have sorting. Um, I don't have any control over which columns I can display or hide. Um, I'd like to have that capability, and um, I'd like to have some of the other uh, features that uh, come with um, the data grid. So I'm going to just take this show column menu property and add it to that data grid. Uh, that data grid is under pages, and then this is my manage employees page so this is my manage employees now this grid has quite a bit of stuff going on and if you're wondering what some of the syntax is here if it looks a little um looks a little different than usual uh, you see the title is at l and then i have braces in these um, different placeholders that's because this application is localized so if I go back to my Blazing Coffee app, where you see name, address, phone, and team name and rating and budget, um, you're not going to see those names in the title here because they're global or uh, localized, um, and they're going to pull the proper language for those items into those placeholders. So if I go up to my gear here, you'll see a nice pop-up. I can check the language that I want. Um, I'll select Bulgarian for uh, engineering folks and support and all of our PM staff that's out there right now. Um, and you'll see that the language changed for the entire application. And it also changed uh, the currency uh, that is being used. So it's a really nice feature. But in case you're wondering what all of these uh, at L things are for right here, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Whenever you see at L, that's calling the localization for those fields. Um, on top of the column names that you see, also the filtering mechanisms and all of the buttons around the UI have also localized. And that's part of the framework working with localization with us. So very cool stuff. I'm going to change back here. My Bulgarian is not that sharp yet that I'm able to navigate the app completely. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump back over to English here. But I just wanted to point out that that at L is localizing all of those values for us. Um, let's get on to adding that column. Uh, so now if I go up to my Telerik grid and I've got quite a few properties here, uh, let's go ahead and create a new line and kind of organize this a little bit because we're starting to get pretty heavy on the amount of features we're adding. Uh, so I've got my filter mode. It's resizable, uh, but I want to show a column menu true. Then we'll go back to that same screen uh, after the page reloads. And we should be able to go to our human capital here and we have our menu items. I'm running some special themes here. It looks like I might be uh, overriding something in one of our, it's, maybe it's a localization uh, value that's not supported yet. Uh, so I, I do see a little something there, but uh, we do have our column menus uh, with our lock and filter. Um, yeah, if, and uh, if any of our folks are watching, if uh, you have an idea of why the names didn't come through with the localized values, let me know. Uh, but now I have the ability to toggle uh, those menu items or the columns. 
And uh, I can also set my filters here and set my sorting. So that's pretty good. Uh, localization needs to be updated with the new keys. Um, is that something that was on on me? Did I not update uh, all of my dependencies properly? Let me just double check. So, oh yeah, support's got me. My support folks are, are chiming in now. Um, this is on me. So. I figured it was. Uh, so it's a good thing I pointed out uh, that localization stuff because those weird keys that I talked about, they're coming through. And uh, this is part of the setup process um, when I created that localization. Uh, that localization is actually sitting out in my shared uh, project. So you'll see this is a full stack application. I have client, server, and shared. And in shared, I have a folder called localization. I also have a folder called resources. And this is where I'm missing uh, the proper information. So what I'm going to do here, this is actually a good, um, I'm glad this happened live so I can show you how to fix it. Uh, this is going to be under my installed resources here. So I'm going to go over to my C drive where my Teller UI libraries are uh, pre-installed. So if I go under progress, uh, Telerik UI for Blazor 1.7, um, this is going to be under uh, demos. This is where I know to get it. There may be a better place. Uh, yeah, demos, Blazor demos, uh, resources. Um, and then I need to copy all of those translations over to my application. Um, if I am doing this uh, in not the most efficient way, please let me know in chat. That's the place. Um, I've renamed mine, so these names might uh, have um, conflict here. So I'm going to go ahead and just rename them again. So each one of these I had named uh, Telerik messages because I had multiple uh, files in here at one point. The apps changed a little bit over time. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, these are named properly. And these will have the updates for all the new UI bits that I just installed with uh, 2.1.7. And then I can't remember if Messages had the Telerik moniker on it as well. We'll check um, on this change list here and look at Shared. Yeah, Telerik Messages uh, is missing from that bundle. So if I add that, that should solve my problem. So I just added all those those translations for all the um, UI components uh, to my application. We'll we'll do a, a nice rebuild here, and uh, something is still missing from the items I deleted. Let me go back into this. Is why Git is so helpful. I think I may have gotten a little uh, ham-handed with. Uh, with uh, some of the deleting that I did. Where's my change list? All right. Um, I need to undo that change. And then I think there's a namespace out of sorts. Teller messages it says it cannot find. Um, this class. This is actually a generated file. I don't know why it's not regenerating correctly, but it didn't. So we'll just go ahead and fix that. It's still not happy with it. Um, OK. 
trying to remember, how do I rerun the generator to get that back? Is it this one? Nope. There is a... Um, choose, choose no generation. Properties. Um, let's see, which one was it? Uh, if I open the RESX file... There we go. There is a generator in here that is causing me trouble. Access modifier from the drop down. There we go. Um, no code and then enable it to public and then save it and that should I don't claim to be a globalization localization expert so thank you very much Marin I think that did the trick so now we have our, our uh, globalization back and we should be able to load that back up and if I go to human capital again there we go look at that that's much better much much better <laughs> uh, so again this isn't um, this is all live coding so you know some of the stuff we're doing on the fly here I haven't even tried before uh, so appreciate uh, Marin is from our support team and this is the type of stuff that he has to deal with on a regular basis so he's walking me through uh, some of the support questions that he gets uh, so I mean he's he's nailing these on the fly here um, so now I have my translations back in. So what that did, though, you saw those placeholders come up. I'm really glad I pointed that out from the get-go. Uh, when those placeholders come up, what that allows us to do is when I switch languages again, uh, these are now filled in with the proper language. And that's what those resource files are that I just copied over from my installation directory into the project itself. Uh, so again, th this project has quite a few features in it, some of them even above my own head, even though I built them in. Uh, yeah, so the generated, um, uh, Bobby's chiming in here, the generated localization files have different uh, namespaces, and that's why the generation is needed. Indeed, uh, we've also got, I've also got custom um, globalization in here. Uh, so in my application, we cover as uh, the Telerik UI for library, um, Telerik UI for Blazor library covers um, all the UI stuff that you see in here. Uh, what isn't covered is things like the word employees and uh, stuff that is in you know your custom uh, code that you wrote. Uh, so I have files for that as well, and they're all combined into a single resource that's loaded. Uh, so it has um, the the resource files for that too, and then Marin has a good uh, tip here. This is uh, when copying resource files into the solution, code generation is often turned off by default. Um, so you need to turn that on uh, as a rule of thumb. Uh, so we we kind of got a little bit. Uh, off track with the localization stuff, but I, I'm glad we covered it. But um, for the most part, we added this with one property, despite the, um, the project missing some resources that uh, I, I uh, forgot to add when I upgraded from Telerik UI for Blazor 1.5 to 1.7. I think I skipped 1.6 with this app because I'm scared of breaking things like we just saw. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and look at some more features here. Um, what else didn't we get to cover in depth in um, uh, the webinar? One thing here, we have the nice uh, column menus that pop up here, but we also have column visibility, which is something that's new, but I you were able to add it with Blazor um, just by the Blazor framework itself being so intuitive, um, you were able to hide and show columns within the data grid. Uh, there were some drawbacks to doing it with the native uh, Blazor templating that's available, though. And I'll 
show you that. Uh, so let's go over to the Manage Products table. If we go over to Manage Products, this is what I have now. I have an ID field here. The ID field isn't really pertinent to anything that's on the screen, but maybe I need to look at the ID for some, um, some niche scenario, right? So I can toggle that ID on and off if I want to view it. Uh, I could easily just add that same menu um, that we added uh, to this grid where we can toggle any column. But there's scenarios where you maybe don't want to show uh, that editor there and you just want to enable one field per se uh, like this ID field and toggle that on and off. Now if you're using Blazor's templating language wherever that um, if the column appears in a certain order and you toggle it on and off it'll just by the rendering engines default it'll end up in this last rightmost column uh, when you start toggling it. So that's not uh, ideal. So let's go back to uh, manage products here and let's take out the legacy code that I've got in here and we'll add um, the the uh, inherent uh, property that we just um, added through the update. So the old way of doing this was uh, I'm going to go through my collection of grid columns here and then I have an if statement. Notice the ID is the first item but it was showing up as the last. Uh, because of the way the rendering engine works. Uh, but it has an if statement around it, and it says if it's the ID is visible, uh, we'll go ahead and either shide or show or hide um, this column. Uh, this is not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is the new way. So we'll take out that if statement that wraps the column, and instead we'll use the visible property in here. And we will say is visible, is ID visible there? And now when I go back, we'll notice there's going to be a little bit different behavior there. When I come back to the page and I toggle my ID on, notice it's in the left hand most column where it belongs. Uh, that's where the, uh, the column was actually defined, whereas before it ended up on the end because of the templating engine and how rendering works in Blazor. So now that it's integrated, it's a much better user experience. So good stuff there. I uh, love the updates that we're coming out with. Uh, these are all really important features to have. Um, this is another nice one that I didn't get time for in the webinar. Uh, we have time to look at now. Uh, we, we actually have a search box. This is come to, kind of like an omni search uh, for your data grid. I know I'm focusing on the data grid for a little bit here. We'll, we'll look at some other controls um, as we uh, move, move through some demos here, but I just wanted to focus on this. Uh, this search box is built into the data grid now, and what it lets you do is search multiple columns and filter them all at once. Um, so if I were to, uh, let's see, what is something that... Like if I type the word ash here, it's going to pick up Washington because it has ASH in it. Um, but it will also pick up uh, the ASH in the address line here. And let's see if we have any other ones that stick out. Uh, the point being, it's going through, not only is it filtering all the Washingtons, but anything else that has those three letters in it. Um, here's another example, just typing in this fuzzy search here. Um, anything with e, e double L in it shows up no matter what column uh, that it appears in. So that's a cool feature that we can add uh, to any app. Um, I don't know if I need it in this application necessarily, but uh, we can take a look at how that's defined. Um, in our grid, we have a grid toolbar. You'll see me using this in some of the other demos here. Uh, the grid toolbar is um, this item up here at the top. You can customize that. My toggle uh, button is a custom uh, grid toolbar command uh, that does an on-click event that I 
can customize to anything that I'd like to call when that button is pressed. So these grid toolbar commands are very flexible. Oh, let's go ahead and see if we can add this one here as well. Well, um, we have uh, we can add an item or we can toggle whether the ID is true or false. Let's go in ahead and add um, a search bar here and see what we get. Uh, so I'll just copy and paste this code, and uh, it should be as simple as that. Uh, what's nice here is you notice there is a debounce delay that is built into the components. You don't have to worry about debouncing the search. This is actually a pretty big deal in Blazor. Let me explain why. This is some of the information uh, you're probably not going to either get or think about right off the top of looking at a demo like this. But that debounce delay is very, very important. Um, I don't think we even, yeah, we don't mention it on the page here, but uh, it is extremely important in the world of Blazor because remember that Blazor doesn't necessarily run on the web client 100% of the time. Uh, there is Blazor WebAssembly, there is Blazor Server. And if I'm running Blazor on the server, and I have somebody typing in a search box, I don't want to ping the server every letter they press. I want to have some type of debounce. And what a debouncer does is says that I'm going to wait a certain number of milliseconds before I call out to um, the method that refreshes that data. And that allows me time to type and then let uh, the user stop before I make a call to the server. If you're running Blazor server and you have somebody pounding away on a text box and you're listening for every keystroke, you're filling up your WebSocket with a bunch of requests that uh, not only are um, hitting rapidly, but for the first, uh, in this case, it was six or seven keystrokes, the first six keystrokes, I don't really care about, so I'm going to throw away the information that comes back anyway. So we don't want to do that. Instead, what we want to do is wait for the user to quit typing and then make the event, uh, raise the event, and make the method call. So that's really nice to have um, uh, in, enabled in uh, the search box itself. So... Uh, I've added that to um, my thing, and there's also a mention in here that our autocomplete uh, has the same uh, debounce functionality. So again, these are these are things that you might not think about um, on the surface. If you go to build something like that uh, for yourself, um, that is something that uh, you run into. You uh, you know you start start down the path of I'm going to create this thing uh, you start plugging away at it and then you realize oh this can get really messy really fast and then hundreds of lines of code later <laughs> you're working on a debounce um, uh, a debounce algorithm for the thing that you're working on so we've added that I like that we've added it right out of the box for you so you don't have to think about it just knowing it's there is important um, and then you can take advantage of that uh, so added the search box, added a debounce delay. Let's see if we need anything else from this. Go back to my page. Notice I have my search box on this side. Um, I'm going to say uh, T. Oh, look at that. Um, that was it. That was all the code I needed. So I, ju I just, I've never used this feature before in my life. Um, I try to keep up with uh, all the new stuff, but I'll be perfectly honest, you know, we have multiple engineers on our Teller QI for Blazor team. We have staff on all of our UI components, um, and it's impossible for me as one developer advocate to keep up with every engineer and all of the uh, feature updates and new components that they're making. So a lot of these things I don't get to try until they're released um, just because there aren't, aren't enough hours in the day for me to keep up with uh, all the wonderful folks in Bulgaria doing all the hard work that they do. Uh, so this is the first time I've gotten to actually write code and try the, um, try the new search uh, feature. I knew it was coming. 
didn't get to touch it until today. And uh, I have to say, I'm impressed. All I had to do is add uh, the grid search box, and my uh, Teller Data Grid uh, was able to implement um, that search behavior. Uh, this page in particular is a, is a nice demo to look at. Um, because this one has full CRUD operations. So not only did I just add search, but uh, it already had uh, CRUD operations um, in the data grid itself. Uh, this is something I built over uh, a couple weeks on the show that I do on Fridays, uh, but uh, we can take a quick look at it and it'll help explain why that search box was so powerful with just such a minimal amount of code. Uh, so what's nice here is I've got this CRUD operation set up and it's using something called a data source request object. And this is something that is uh, custom to um, the Telerik UI for Blazor and generally you'll find in our data bound components, but primarily the data grid, the tree, uh, tree lists, uh, list view, things like that. Uh, so what it does is when I click on edit, uh, not only do I get the edit information, um, I can post CRUD operations really easy, but when I search, uh, this data source request object is going back and forth between my server, and um, I'm able to filter these items through uh, NAD Framework. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me dig into the code real quick, make sure I've got the right example here. These are all the CRUD ops, but I also have, actually maybe thinking of this demo here, this one will, will help explain. Um, if I look in at my sales report, uh, this is the one I was actually thinking of, uh, I'm passing that data source request object um, in the clear here. When I make a call out, you at maybe easier to see on the receiving end let me go to the let me go to the controller it'd be easier to see on the controller I think uh, so let's go to server controller um, it is going to be on my sales control here we go much easier to see on the on the request end of it because i'm actually taking advantage of it here uh, so what the data source request does is when i'm doing uh sorting filtering um all of those things it all gets bundled up matter of fact let's let's have some fun here we'll put a breakpoint on this and we'll go ahead and run the app in debug mode and we'll take a good look at the data source request object. And this will help with, um, with that search behavior, I believe, to understand how easily we can add things uh, to the grid and um, take full advantage of those capabilities that are, are part of this. Uh, let's see here. In debug mode, it's going to take a little bit longer to load up just because we need some resources for debugging and I'm live streaming. And you can see we're getting some uh, memory going here. Let me try restarting that one more time. Unless it's already hit that breakpoint. I didn't see breakpoint light up. The demo gods are not with me today. They are very much against me. What is it stalling out on? And this is just indicative of uh, .NET development today. What is this doing? Um, the diagnostic tools, I wonder if it's something to do with presentation mode. Let me pop out of presentation mode and see if that is what's causing it to hang. Something, something on the .NET stack is doing this. You see Visual Studios hung. Womp, womp. <laughs> All right. Come on, Visual Studio. Give it up already. 
We're going to have to kick it. Let's go into regular Visual Studio. We won't open presentation mode that time. I think something in presentation mode is, is causing it to glitch out. Um, I try to use presentation mode because uh, it's a custom build of Visual Studio that I have um, that has much bigger fonts in all of the titles. Let's see if we can get this running on IAS again. And uh, there we go. Even though it popped three error windows from Visual Studio, <laughs> we have debugging mode uh, enabled now. Uh, let's go log back in. All my views have authentication and authorization, and now it's stuck on the login screen. All right, there we go. Um, I don't recall. Now this looking at localhost, I don't recall the login here. We'll just go ahead and create a new user. Uh, I'll register. Uh, we'll come up with another fake password. And hopefully that lets us register. We'll save. There we go. Um, go over to sales, and there we go. Sorry about the, you know, the live hurdles that we have to jump through, but uh, we have our data source request now, and it has resolved this request. We'll take a look at what's in here, uh, and this has filters. It has um, sort, skip, page, uh, all the information that we need to uh, get the results back from the data grid that we want. Uh, what's nice about this is it plugs in directly to Entity Framework. So what I can do is I can call um, with uh, my Entity Framework DB context. I can call up the table and pass this um, extension method saying to data source result async. And we'll pass in that data source request object that I showed that has the aggregates, filtering, sorting, grouping, paging, etc. And it will produce the correct SQL that it needs uh, for um, for NAD framework for it to tr to uh, generate the SQL code to query uh, our database. And if I can find the right, it hasn't happened yet. I'll go ahead and hit continue, and I want to go back into my debugger, and I should have. Um, let's see, where is, yeah, there we go. So you'll see, as I go through the process here, I click on my data grid, I do some filtering and sorting, that information gets passed to my controller as a request, um, a data source request object. Uh, that then gets passed off to Entity Framework, which can form the proper SQL code to get just the information from my data that I need. Um, so what's nice here is uh, the data grid is, is, um, is coupled with uh, EF so that when I sort uh, my data, it gets sorted on SQL Server, not locally on the client. It's something I have to opt into, but when you um, add this data source request to your controller, which is a very easy process to do. It's literally just one line um, of code with an extension method. Say so two data source results async. The data source request is making sure that I'm only querying the data necessary for that current view. So I'm only going to pull back 10 records because that's my page size. Um, I'm only pulling back this current page set. So just those ten, just the ten records that I requested is all that comes back from Entity Framework. Therefore, that's all that gets passed down the wire is JSON, and that's all I have to serialize in my data grid. That makes it very efficient. It also makes it very extensible, um, so things can be added, uh, like the search box that I can just type into and filter multiple columns at once. So this is very cool stuff. Um,
there's lots of things that we can do with that uh, data source request object. While we're on the topic of the data source request, we should look at another uh, feature. This is a sandboxed browser. Uh, another feature that's related to all of this, that's that's uh, part of this release, um, and that is, let's see if I can find it here, uh, not only the footer template, that's also part of this whole process. Uh, so we have, uh, you saw in that data source request object, we have aggregates. That's where the aggregates get bubbled up, is uh, from that same object. Um, we also have new filter capabilities, I thought. Uh, shoot. I thought we had some new filtering capabilities. I was going to poke around at, maybe it was sorting. Ah, it was sorting, my bad. Uh, so we also have things like uh, multi-column sorting. So you can see this is single column sorting here. But we've actually upgraded uh, the grid to support multi-column sorting. Uh, so we have that. Um, there were filter updates. I know there's filter updates. There is, do we not have a new demo though? Um, so we have custom filters enabled now as well. And I know that was on the release notes, but it looks like we, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Marin or any of the other folks from the team, if I'm missing uh, the new filtering capabilities as, as a demo. I know there's some in here. Uh, we have the brand new group button, the column menu, the search box, the sorting, the filter, the uh, footer template and aggregates, uh, custom filter rows and menus. There we go. This is what I was talking about. So there is the filter row. There it is. So we do have we do have a uh, demo for it. it. Oh, it's right there. Somehow I scanned over it two or three times. Um, so this is all part of that same data source request object that I was talking about. Um, ah, thanks, Marin. Uh, so this came out in a service pack release, but uh, bubbled up to the uh, full release uh, in the, the release notes. Um, so you can do custom filters. So we can do drop down boxes, you name it. Um, I think you get what the word custom means. I don't have to explain it. Uh, you can do all sorts of uh, filtering uh, based on your own criteria and uh, UI components and whatever. Um, that's because it's all powered by that same data source request. Uh, so you're feeding in um, the data source uh, request, um, what's called a filter uh, descriptor. As long as you have that filter descriptor, which essentially says what column is it, what is the value of it, and then what is the operator. So, for example, if it's text, uh, you might have can, if it contains or is equal to, um, or if it is uh, a numeric, you might have um, greater than, less than, uh, something like that. Um, null has no value, etc. That's the operator that I'm talking about. And then the value is either the string or the integer that you're filtering by. As long as you have that information, um, it doesn't really matter how you collected that information. As long as you have it, you send it to the data source request, it's going to pull back the data that you asked for. So it's very flexible. Uh, we have documentation on all of it. Um, and it's in this demo here as well. If we look uh, there is a, a custom filter um, in place already on that page. Uh, let's refresh here. I think my app shut down. It did. My app isn't running anymore, so I need to run that again. So if we look back at our sales page, um, we're, we're doing some custom filtering here. And for this one, I'm using a, um, another component uh, for the filtering. Uh, the filtering is being done by our date range picker, which is one of my favorites, because writing date range um, logic is not fun. 
And what we can do here is we can set a start date and an end date just by dragging over um, the calendar component here. And uh, it will pick up that date range. That's all built in. That's the date range, Telerik UI for Blazor date range picker. That's doing the custom filtering in this scenario. Uh, so we're leveraging that. Uh, so we've got search. Uh, we've got the ability to do custom filtering. Uh, lots of great stuff in this release. Ah, yes. Uh, Bobby's correcting me here. Uh, R3 had three releases, uh, 2.15, 16, and 17. Um, we, we have a little bit of an aggressive release cycle with Blazor uh, just because um, it's so new and we're trying to get the new features out there and our team's doing uh, an amazing job at keeping the pace on all that stuff. All right. Uh, one of the things that we pointed out during the webinar is um, the, uh, the example from support where I'll do it again just in case you missed it because this is really cool. And I've got an example of it um, in this app as well. So I want to kind of share that and then um, I just want to make sure everybody is able to find this. I talked about it in the webinar very briefly. Uh, let me see. I've got a note here to go back and grab that. Uh, I thought this was really cool. Document processing is something that we do well and don't talk about enough. Um, so this is a cool support ticket. Uh, actually, not a support ticket. My bad. Um, this is a very cool uh, um, feedback request. Uh, so we have our feedback forum, which is feedback.telerik.com, and somebody's posted, uh, can I export the grid to Microsoft Word? Um, sounds like a pretty big ask, but it's actually something that you can do uh, with the framework as it stands. Uh, so Marin actually posted a zip file in here. Uh, and we'll share this. I'll share this directly myself in the chat. Uh, since I have it up on the screen. So you can find that, that um, example right here. It's very complex um, to write doc files, uh, but we have a nice library to wrap some of this behavior. Uh, so I'm going to open up my uh, Visual Studio. Um, I used this one for the presentation, so it's, we'll go back to the light theme for a few minutes here. Uh, and here's the doc export solution you'll find in that zip file. Um, so what we can do in uh, Telerik UI for Blazor is uh, we can access directly uh, what's called the DPL or Document Processing Library uh, for the Telerik libraries. All of the Telerik libraries have access to this. Um, depending on what platform you're running on, uh, your um, resources may vary as to where you find uh, the document processing, whether it's Xamarin, uh, web forms, win forms, you name it. They all have this um, library supported in some way, shape, or form. Uh, <laughs> the, the light theme is, uh, um, is Blinding Eva. I'm sorry. We switched over to light theme for a little bit. We got to mix it up for everybody that's here. Um, so what we have, very simply, the data grid right here. Uh, and there's that custom toolbar button again that I talked about. Uh, and we've got a button on that grid that is uh, has a click event. This is export to Word. And this is pretty cool. Uh, what we're able to do with this, this framework um, is just frankly amazing. We've got a data grid. I'm going to close all the other tabs for a minute. Uh, we've got a data grid. doesn't matter what really the data is here. Uh, what's important is we can export the data to a Word document all through .NET code. And there's no additional libraries needed, just the Blazor framework and Telerik UI for Blazor is all that's needed to do this. Um, but we've got the, the document processing here. Um, we're not actually taking the data grid itself and 
uh, using the data grid within the Word document. But instead what we're doing is we're binding the data grid to the same data set that is being used to produce a Word document. Uh, so we've got a button that's integrated into the data grid that calls up a custom uh, method. That custom method makes a call out to the data source, uh, gets the data, and then when it gets the data, it's going to iterate over that data and create a brand new Word document from scratch. Um, you can see here we're creating a data table in that Word document and then iterating over each, um, each data point in that data set and writing out a uh, Word document table row. And each time we do that, we're going to create a data uh, a row in that data table. And then we'll return that entire document out and then trigger a download on the client. And then we have our data exported to a Word document. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, in, let's see, it's all, all the logic and markup are combined into this one file. I believe. I don't think there's additional. Um, I think everything is in this one sample here, and it's only 100 lines of code. It's 100 lines of code. Um, you could easily take out the create document method here and put it in a common library somewhere. Um, and then your UI uh, portion of this is only the first few lines of code here. So pretty cool stuff. Um, and then uh, Marin says the feedback portal has another link that has more sophisticated uses and can use uh, data grid um, data source requests to capture all the filtering, sorting, and paging as well. Uh, so there's lots of good stuff out there um, on that feedback portal and uh, it just shows uh, us closing the loop a little bit on the fact that uh, we have support um, and we do a good job at supporting our customers when they have questions like that. Uh, it, things We get asked for things a lot, and they might not necessarily be uh, features that belong out of the box in the tool set because we can already accomplish so much with, uh, like I said in the webinar, the Lego bricks that we provide can do a lot. So um, oftentimes support can step in and they can offer solutions um, ad hoc that uh, would take months or, or longer to get uh, baked into the product. Uh, Jeff is asking, where can you get the Blazing Coffee app? Um, actually, let me, I got a direct link right here. You can find it on um, our GitHub page. Now, um, I, will, I will give you a little heads up. Uh, it does generate a database on your uh, first run. So that first execution of it might take a second as it, it spins up in any framework. And also uh, it does require NPM because there are some pretty heavy theming um, scenarios in here. So let's take a look at theming really quick uh, since uh, Jeff was asking about the project. Um, and when you run it for the first time, you're gonna wanna run NPM install because it needs a SAS theme compiler. And it, the best way to get that is through uh, the NPM ecosystem. So I'm using NPM to get, um, to get the uh, SAS tooling and, uh, and to do the SAS compilation. So let's talk about themes for a second. We've got about 45 minutes left. So um, it's a good chance to talk about theming. Uh, let me run the application one more time. We'll run the app one more time. We'll talk about theming, then I want to talk about um, our editor component uh, we have as well. Our editor and our tile layout would be nice to chat about too. So you'll notice that I have a dark theme everywhere pretty much. Uh, Eva even commented on it uh, when I changed over to the light theme. So, you know, we, we devs spend a lot of time in the dark, I imagine. Everybody likes dark themes myself included. But if I go to my personal settings on my OS, 
you'll notice I have a dark theme on um, on windows and if I come over to colors and I choose my light theme notice that my applicant or my um, my browser's changed themes here, and if I refresh my application, my app changes themes as well. So this was using a dark mode theme just a moment ago. And now that I've changed my OS theme, my application has now themed along with it. And if I look at my settings tab, I actually have control over this, and I can set this to automatic where it will follow my operating system theme. And when I say OS theme, this would follow on Android as well. And then uh, on, I can override this and say, always give me the dark theme. I don't care what my OS says. Uh, I can also do that for light. And then I can set it back to automatic. And now if I go to my OS theme again, change it back to dark. As soon as I refresh my application, the Blazing Coffee app is now dark theme as well. So that's really cool, but it does, um, it does require two things here. Uh, first of all, if I go to theme builder, themebuilder.telerik.com, I can fully customize the Telerik UI for Blazor theme. Um, so I'm going to go to themebuilder.telerik.com, I'm going to click UI for Blazor, start theming, and then I can select any of the components or all of the components I want to theme. And I'm going to go ahead and click create. And this will start a brand new theme for me. Um, I can go through, uh, I'm getting a little lag because of the live stream, I believe. Uh, so this is going a little slow to render. But you'll see I have uh, my data grid here, my tree lists, all the components that are in the library get rendered out in real time um, where we can theme all of the components. So if I come over and change my colors, I can change them individually, or I can select from these many theme swatches. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this like green theme, and uh, it will apply to all of the items here. Just now it, it, it um, triggered. You can see I've got that uh, very fall, uh, autumn looking theme uh, throughout my application now. Even even updates the loader. Look at that. Once I'm happy with my theme, I can hit download, and then I can name it, and click OK. And it's going to generate a uh, file for me, and I can download that uh, as a zip file. What's interesting here, though, is I've got in my zip file a CSS and a SAS file. And the SAS file is what I'm using in my Blazing Coffee app, which is why I require NPM for it. So your NPM installation is going to get the tooling needed to compile that SAS library, or that SAS file. Uh, but what's nice is if I dig into the theme folder in my Blazing Coffee app, is I'm taking full advantage of the Telerik UI for Blazor's theming capabilities. And I am, uh, let's see, is in the variable section here. These are all the Telerik UI uh, theme values. And all I have to do to retheme my entire application, both light and dark values, uh, is to change some of the base colors here. So we can do this a little more manually if we wanted to. Um, for example, if I wanted to grab this flat theme, which I think is pretty cool here, um, I can do that. And uh, it'll update all of this. I can hit download. Download our flat theme. And uh, we, we can see that this, this flat theme has some nice uh, like turquoise colors and stuff in it that are really nice. Um, I can go into this variables CSS file. I'll just open it in Visual Studio Code just so we can see it a little easier. And then all of these uh, accent colors and whatnot, we'll just move those over to our application. Let me make sure I've got, yeah, and it goes down to here, up to here. We can paste those directly in, and then uh, let's try rerunning the app. May have to do a special build to get that color theme in there, but we'll double check here. We need to do 
a full reload of our cache. There we go. We didn't have to do anything special. Now we've got a brand new theme for the entire app. And uh, it obeys the light and the dark theme uh, because it's using that SAS uh, technology. Uh, so what we can do next is, oh, sorry, let me go back to my app is running. Uh, we'll type in theme, we'll go to our, our uh, we could follow our OS, actually don't need to do that, I can set it here. Uh, we'll see that I have a light theme that follows those components as well. Uh, so there's that turquoise color, you see it popping up everywhere now. Oh, I need to click out of the app. So it's pretty nice. We can we can change the theme just that easily uh, with a couple um, couple lines of uh, color properties. So when you build the uh, Blazing Coffee app for the first time, uh, make sure you have npm installed and do the npm install command line task so those SAS themes get built out correctly. Good stuff. All right, uh, so more new stuff that we didn't cover in the webinar. Huge component, um, didn't get enough attention. Uh, we have our editor now. So we have a what you see is what you get style editor. If you're building a blog or you're building um, uh, something for a content manager or you're, you, you need a place for users to input uh, more than just regular text, uh, we have the editor, and the editor is customizable with uh, uh, custom toolbars that you can add uh, your own, uh, for example, formatting um, or insert functionality. There's all sorts of things that you can do uh, with the, um, let's see, I think I should have highlighted some stuff when I hit that one. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so you can, you can create your own tools to interact with uh, the lines of text here as well. Uh, so it's really extensible. Uh, again, supports that uh, globalization, localization that I've been showing off in this application the entire time. Uh, notice the, um, the values there get updated as well. Uh, even supports validation, uh, so you can set uh, length of text and things like that. So. Um, the uh, the editor is definitely uh, a very complex component to build uh, yourself. So this gives you the ability to just plug right into Blazor. If you look at the source code for this, um, adding the component is is just as simple as saying uh, Telerik editor, and then you can use data binding even to bind that value, um, and then you can you can save this uh, HTML value back. Or a string value back to your server uh, to persist that in Entity Framework. Um, what format is the editor using? It's just a string, uh, a string of HTML. So the editor generates HTML for you, um, and you can you can save that HTML uh, back to SQL as a string, or persist it wherever you like. Yeah, it's a, it's a complete string with, uh, it's um, HTML serialized to a string. That's the best way to put it, I think. Um, let's see here. I think, do we have, yeah, we have um, the viewer too, where you can view you can view that value, that HTML value right there, um, and edit that HTML in line uh, with with the tool toolbar enabled for HTML. Uh, so if you want to have an HTML glimpse at what uh, what's going on there, you can do that too. Uh, so that that's probably one of the best ways to show the data though that it's generating when you add things. Uh, like for example, if we change this to an H2 paragraph header or H2 header instead of H1, you can see this H2 style has changed right there. So a uh, really good editor for um, for your users if you want to provide like a a word like uh, editing experience.
So that's what that icon does. Absolutely, uh, this shows the code behind uh, for for the markup that's uh, being rendered out here. Um, and then, of course, you have all the drop downs to control different um, different elements on the page. You can control fonts, font sizes. There's full undo redo functionality as well, which is super handy for users because uh, if you're like me, you're all thumbs and you type everything wrong the first time around. Uh, we can um, we can insert uh, uh, images into the document as well, uh, edit the sizes and things like that. Uh, just more of an example of it here. And we already have um, an image. We can you know change the width and height of that image uh, right through the UI. And like typical typical users, we're going to stretch that image out and uh, ignore the aspect ratio completely. Uh, can you use it in a window? Absolutely. Um, if you want to use stuff in a window in Blazor, it's very simple uh, with our, our window component. So you'll see me in, in the Blazing Coffee app actually using window components very often. Um, close some of this stuff down. Um, to put anything in a window, you just wrap the, uh, the component in a window tag and give it a method to show or hide. So here we've got the settings for our app in a window component. We can do the same thing with an editor. Uh, the other thing that we can do, uh, this is a little bit outside the Teller box. I've got a third party library installed in here. Um, I have in the Blazing Coffee app, I don't know if this version is on GitHub yet. It's the one I'm currently working on, but you'll notice that I have markdown files throughout the project. So I'm going to go into pages and my index page, for example. We'll zoom way in here. Whoa, too far. Um, we have our index page. And under my index page, I have index.razor.markdown. Interesting. So what's going to happen here is I have a markdown file in my project. Um, I have a script that picks that up and puts it in the public domain. So I have a docs folder under WW root here. So if you look under WW root, you'll see that same index.razor.markdown file. Uh, this gets picked up by tooling and placed there in the WW root directory where it can be found through an HTTP call. So I can use um, HTTP dot uh, um, get, get string async, I think is what it's called, get async string. Uh, let's take a look at the method that actually pulls this in. Let's go over to our shared folder. Layout, main layout should have the method in it. Uh, we can call uh, get string async off an HTTP request and find that document in the um, in the WW root folder. Uh, and since it's just a string, we can go ahead and pass that to a, uh, a NuGet package called markdig and turn it into HTML. That HTML, then we can pipe into a Telerik window and display it in our application. I know that was a little long-winded, but check this out. Uh, when I'm on the index page, if I click on this question mark button, um, I have some text there. It's not very good. I need to update that file. Let's try it on this page. There we go. That's a little bit better. Um, let's try another one. I know I've got one here that I've fully completed. Like I said, this is a work in progress. There we go. So that markdown file gets turned into HTML and then displayed within a Telerik window. You could use an editor in that pane as well. Um, in this case, I'm using Markdown, but you could put that HTML um, into an editor. Let's try something. Let's do an experiment. I've got a little bit of time. Uh, let's take this window. So it currently takes HTML and puts it in um, inside of a Telerik window as raw HTML, which gets rendered in the browser uh, inside of the window. What, what if we did this instead? So I'm going to take this out, and I'm going to put in a Telerik editor. 
Um, and I'm going to set the value to, is it docs? What am I putting this in? Uh, result docs with a capital D, yes. Specified. Um, let's see here. Yeah, it should be docs. Uh, so I'm going to put that together like this. Since it's a string, it needs to be escaped. So this is going to be docs. And I think, let's try that. Let's try that first. If it breaks, then we'll go back and, and see what else we need. Let's see if we can put an editor there. And instead of just rendering the HTML, we'll see if it renders the HTML in an editor window. Uh, it was on this page that it looked the best. Um, my theme, again, something with my theming is, is taking, uh, taking over this uh, coloring here, but look at this. There's our editor. Uh, let's try, let's try the light theme just because um, it seems like uh, my my custom CSS code is overriding the framework just a little bit. So the question was, can we put um, the editor on a window? And here's the editor in a window. And there, it's pulling the markdown from a file. Now, if I tried to save this, it would save HTML. It would not save markdown, just for clarity. Um, but uh, we can we can place that rendered markdown in the editor, and the editor understands HTML. Uh, so it's kind of a one-way import that we just did. So we imported a word, or uh, we imported a markdown uh, document into it. Um, uh, once once you edit it, it becomes HTML though. So that's kind of a one-way deal there. It's really hard to get HTML back into Markdown just in general. Uh, so very cool though. Um, we can even expand that uh, that window a little bit. Uh, we could make the height a little bit taller. Uh, let's see if that helps a little bit. It was still a little hard to see. It was a little bit crunched up. So if I increase the size of the, the window, it might be able to show the editor a little better. Um, I need to increase the height. Actually, I, I increased the height of the wrong thing, I think. So the height of the window actually should have gone, gone to the editor. So editor height, let me try that one instead. Uh, we do have um, we do have an example, look at that. So Marin posted an example of how to use um, HTML to markdown and markdown to HTML. Uh, so we, we actually have a sample of that. I was completely unaware. Uh, thanks for the sample. Um, uh, Marin, good stuff. Uh, I have to share that uh, later. Uh, so let's try this one more time. There we go. Now the editor's kind of filling out a little bit bigger space So because I gave it some height to work with. Look at that. There we go. It's a nice rendering of it. Um, but once it's in here, you know, we can, we can change things and uh, we can bold on bold, italic, all that good stuff, because it's in an editor. Good stuff. Uh, I'll have to have to look more into the the two way, um, saving it back to Markdown. Good. Uh, the .NET ecosystem I noticed in in this. Let me go back to uh, this example. Um, there are uh, Markdown uh, Markdown tools already for the .NET ecosystem that are helping with the translation of those things. And just like I'm using Markdig uh, to load the Markdown, you can use other things to re-render the Markdown back to, or the HTML back to Markdown. Um, let's see. So we talked about the editor. Uh, let's see if I can do one more thing before we go. Uh, we've got this page here, and I want to add the new tile layout. Let's see if I can get the tile layout working in that page. Uh, the tile layout's another thing that we just added that I think is really cool. 
the tile layout demo. Um, this is something that can be super handy for an app is to be able to move different components around the page. Uh, there's a couple opportunities for me to use the tile layout, I believe, in my Blazing Coffee app. I have not tried yet. It's a brand new component. I haven't had it that long. Um, so let's let's tinker with that for a second. So on my index page, I've got a couple card components. These are just custom card components I'm using. Uh, we do have a card component on the roadmap coming soon uh, that aligns with the cards that you see in the um, the other frameworks, the uh, the Teller UI for ASP.NET Core, for example, has a card component. Um, we'll have something similar to this in Blazor as well. Um, why I can't find it in the listing there. I saw I, it was new for Ajax as well. We'll take a look at Ajax. I know it's in here in the what's new section. Uh, so this is the card component I'm talking about. Uh, I'm actually utilizing some of the CSS for that, uh, for this project. So you'll see a card here. But what I'd rather do is take all of this and turn it into a tile layout. So maybe the function that you're used to doing is not sales, but something else. So you can kind of move those around. So let's try that. Let's do a tile, um, tile layout, teller tile layout. Uh, teller tile layout. And uh, Marin's putting in chat there that you can vote on these items if you want to see them bumped up in the roadmap. Um, it's helpful to go to the feedback portal and uh, vote on things that you want to see in the library. So that's always good. Feedback.telleric.com if you don't see it down there in the chat. Um, I'm going to go back to the, uh, the uh, demos. Tile layout. Um, I'm going to look at view source real quick just so I get all of the things that I need here. Uh, so I need to give it... Um, say five columns how many columns i want uh, and then i can give it some height and width and things like that so let's start out with a column uh number of columns i'm going to say uh, i only have three items right now we'll, we'll make them take up a column each like that and then once i have that i need the tile layout and the tile layout item and then the number of columns it spans. So I'm going to create a collection basically inside of these um, items here. So we'll have a item. What I'll do is I'll put it in this. I, I won't move anything from this view at first. Uh, we'll just put this here. And then we'll just put, let's put an H1 tag. We'll say this will be where our sales card will go. And then I need to repeat this a couple times. And we'll, we'll do this and we'll, we'll move things over in just a second. So I have, um, what, is, what is in my app again? It's sales. Um, I have a sales card, human capital, and products. Sales, human capital middle and products manage products and then these also have a title I'll just put the title the same as well just to be consistent here and what we should end up with is a tile list with some placeholders that I can then move my cards into as soon as I figure out how I want this to look uh, the column span on this is three I want it to be one we'll change this to one so now I can rerun this, and I should get a double set, right? Uh, and I got a fail of some kind. Something I typed wrong in here, I bet. Uh, blah, blah. Uh, tile layout item does not have a property matching child content. Uh, whenever you see that type of error, it means that you named something wrong here. It should be, I think, content. Um, is the name of 
the actual content that goes in there. I forgot that tag around it. So we'll go ahead and add that tag to each of these. So my markup was bad, basically. So with my, my markup corrected, if I go back, I should be able to see a couple tiles and a tile layout. There they, there they are. Um, I don't have drag, drop, reorder, and stuff um, enabled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move these cards into that container uh, eventually. So the next thing I need to do is say uh, reorderable is true. And then uh, I'll leave resizing off. We can resize, but I'll leave it off. Just maybe, maybe I don't want people resizing these. Just to show that we can go either way with it. So now I should be able to drag and drop. So now I could take my, my three menu items here and I could allow the user to change where they're placed. Um, I already have a title on these. So I'm gonna end up stripping the title off of that and keeping the guts to it. So in my little pseudo card component here, uh, let's go ahead and move it up into where the H tag is. And again, I already have sales there. I'm gonna move my globalized version of it up here. Uh, this image is embedded in, hmm. Let's see what we can do about this. We might need to modify my card. Um, so I'm using K card here. What can I do with this? I've got the image goes outside of the body. I may need, let me render these out. Um, let's see what happens if it renders as is. I can always modify this this card. It's custom to my application. It's not a real card component. I have absolute control over it. Um, let's see what happens if I don't set a title. So we'll move that title out of the card component. And then, uh, let's see. We can also move the heading tags to the header text. Oh, okay. Uh, so we have some templates that we can use as well um, that would help with this, Marin's saying. All right, so there, there's templating available in the card component too, or I mean the tile layout component. So I'm gonna take this text and move it here like so. Whoops, I want just the value. We'll move the value up to where it says human capital and put the, the localized version there. Um, and this might look a little mishmash at first and we can always go back and, and fix her up. Not a problem. It's all very flexible stuff. And notice I'm, I'm using a component within that template region, which is nice. Uh, Blazor lets us do that very easily. Uh, so we, we've supported Blazor natively here, so we get that type of behavior out of the box. We can just embed other components and logic right in there. I'll rerun this. And oh, stretch the images out a bit. That's a, that's a CSS thing. That's something that can be easily fixed. Um, But what we can do here is we can drag and drop these around. Now, um, I probably want to render the information out not using a card necessarily, just because the, the tile items already have a card. So it's kind of a card within a card, which makes it um, a, little, a little goofy. So uh, that's one thing I can do is just take the rendering out of the card and put it directly into um, a different format. Uh, another thing that's being suggested is the cards should be, um, since they're, they're not um, 
they're taking up so much space. I can also change. Yeah, that was a good one. So just changing the overall card size or the um, column size to twice what it was. So I changed the, the tile size to allow for six uh, columns of tiles. So that changed this already. This, this looks a lot better, looks closer to what it was. Um, oh yes, uh, so there was a question about chart labels. Uh, yeah, cardception, <laughs> that's a good one. I like that, the coin that cardception is taking place here. Uh, so this is just a little bit of a, a, a CSS thing that we could we could fix in a very short period of time. Um, if I look at my card rendering logic, this is what it does. Um, it's just kind of overkill for both the tile layout and being inside of a card is all. So if I took, I wonder if I took out the card content, the action template, the footer template, I wonder what happens if I render them out as is. And then this is just a simple string uh, to represent the image. What if we do this? What if we just go back to like basic HTML here? Uh, then we have more control over each individual thing. We'll get rid of some of that cardception that's going on. So we could easily move things out like that. Uh, the button, we could, we could um, manipulate the CSS or call different button styles. Uh, to make that look a little bit better as well. Um, but all this stuff is very much um, controllable by us. Uh, let's see, what other tile elements can we maybe um, resize, reordering? I think everything that's in the tile itself is up to us how we want to render it. So with the button here, what we could do is, let's see, let's look at our buttons real quick button overview uh, we have do we have any properties on the button oh that's odd uh, that, let's see styling we can override the style very easily but is there anything in by default that makes it go full screen or full uh, fill out the column I don't think there is so one thing we could do just easily to replicate uh, that full width button look. So I can come into my button and uh, I could apply, uh, let's see, it has K button, K flat, primary. Uh, we, could, um, we could say that it's in, if it's in here, then um, it will also be, um, let's see, how can we do that? We could say that uh, let's do this one. K button element style uh, with equals 100%. And that didn't do it. Why? Is it the container now that's stopping it? Yeah, these are in a container. We could fool around with that enough, though, to make it go full width like that and drop the out outer card view of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely cardception there. Um, it's it's already rendering, rendering K card. I have double the K cards. So K card on top of K card. Uh, let's see, K card. I should be able to use K card image though then. If this is in, if content is rendering a K card, let's take a look. Oops, I didn't mean to view source. Uh, image inspect. Um, so it's using K tile layout, K card. Uh, then I should be able to use my button style, I thought. Inspect the button style is K card action, but it's not getting, it's not going full width like the others. Why is that? Am I missing? Is it because it's in a K card body and that isn't in a body? Is that correct? Uh, K card actions. Does it need ah K 
K-Cart action stretched. That's what it is. I'm missing a wrapper. We can we can do that though. So if I do K card stretched, like so. I'm using so these K um, these uh, K class CSS classes. Um, is there we go. That that's better. It's a little bit closer to what we've got. Uh, this this icon I can move. Uh, it's about the same though. Uh, the dividers are missing. Not sure why that is there, but uh, that, that's about it. That's about what I wanted. Uh, so we could clean those up really easy. And now I've got a um, component I can drag around like that. Um, this is our tooltip component, by the way. That's doing that login required there. Um, we have our button now. And ah, there we go. I think I think that's about what I wanted. So I could fix all of these to uh, use that same format. Uh, let's see here. So this is an image. We'll move that down here. We'll put the image for the schedule in there. I want to add a scheduler component to this as, as well sometime. Uh, we have the paragraph tag that can stay where it's at. Um, this needs to be wrapped in a card action span like so and then we don't really need a footer template anymore that actually simplifies the markup um, we don't really need a component for, for all that I'm being so lazy not writing an image tag I don't know if you noticed that I copy and paste wherever and whenever possible because I'm the laziest typer that you'll ever meet so we'll move that again and then where card action template comes in uh, we can add that we could have actually abstracted this out too to another custom wrapper that would handle this for us but this is pretty simple markup we don't need to go through the effort I'm making a component to put in here that should clean it up and uh, I'm gonna close all the other tabs uh, now this looks nice there we go so now uh, we've got everything right where we want it. And now if I were to uh, create this um, tile layout for my app, my users can customize where the menu items go for their dashboard. Uh, so watch this, though. If we load this, and we're running up on the end of our 2.30 uh, 2 time frame, um, I'm going to keep going for just a minute here. I just want to show one more thing uh, with this tile layout. Um, we'll finish that up, and then we'll we'll go off stream. Um, I don't think we have any other shows coming up today, so I'll run long here. Support team if uh, and folks in Bulgaria, I know it's getting late there. Um, it's probably like 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the afternoon. No, 9. It's getting late. Um, uh, Curious Drive, yes, it's going to be on YouTube. Uh, but uh, support team, we're at the end of the stream. If you want to go ahead and take off, you can. I'm just going to finish up this card layout really quick and show folks how to persist the state of these items. It should only take a second here. Uh, if I refresh my application, you'll notice that sales always moves back to that first position where it was originally found. What I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to add some state persistence here. Um, so this is, um, there's a demo of this up on demos.teller.com as well on how to do this. Um, on our demo page, I think we go straight to using uh, JavaScript interop. However, in my application, I already have a local storage component or a local storage library installed. So I can say imports, or, or sorry, not imports, um, uh, using went back to another language mentally for a second. Um, uh, it's called Blazard Local Storage. It's something that you can find easily on, um, on NuGet. Uh, so we'll say Blazor Local Storage, Local Storage. So I can inject, I meant inject, not even using inject. Uh, local Storage, I want an I 
local store. I've been coding or I've been presenting for over three hours now. I'm starting to get a little rusty. Inject local storage. I need a code block here. So we'll put a code block down. Um, and then I have uh, my local storage. I need to say something about this, this tile layout, though. So I'm going to say at ref uh, uh, tile layout. This is going to give me a reference to my tile layout. And I can uh, create that reference down here. T teller tile layout is tile layout. Get it, set it. It's a property. And uh, I want to do something with it. So whenever this gets reordered, I want to save the state. So I'm going to say on reorder. There's a reorder tile layout. Where's my event? On reorder. There we go. Whenever I reorder the layout, I want to save state. I don't have a method for that yet, so I need to write it. Uh, what I'm going to do here is say uh, async task uh, save state. And I just noticed that I didn't put it in caps up top. So this, and I didn't spell it right either. Save state. Um, we're going to put this up here as our method. What the heck? Where did it get that from? Lazing, it gibberished my clipboard. Not, I'm not the only one getting tired around here. It looks like my clipboard is too. Uh, save state's gonna go there. And what we'll do here is say, uh, yeah, thanks for all the support folks. It, again, it's getting late in, in Bulgaria where you guys are at. Um, I'm just gonna wrap this up if you want to take off. Thank you so much again. Uh, very much appreciated for all your help today. Uh, we will do um, save state. And to save the state, we want to get our local storage. We're going to save this right on the device. Uh, in our case, it's the browser. So we'll say uh, local storage, um, uh, save, or sorry, set item async. We're going to give it the item, uh, we don't need the item type for this. We just need to give it a key to save it to. Uh, so we'll call it um, index uh, layout like that. And uh, this is awaitable. So we need to say await local storage site item async. Uh, what is it not happy with? Uh, we actually need the key and the value. I missed the value completely here. Uh, tile layout is the component I want to get the state from. And I want to get the state from it. So we'll say tile layout get state. So I'm going to ask the tile layout component what the, the layout state is. Um, and I'm going to stash that away in local storage. And then when this page renders, we'll use the protected, we'll use the lifecycle method here on. Um, on render, hang on a second, it is override on after render async. I know it's a mouthful, and IntelliSense always leaves off the async part for me, so I have to type that back in. Uh, this is going to render when the page, or this is going to activate when the page renders for the first time. So we need to say if uh, this is the first render, we'll go ahead and load the state. To load the state, we're going to call up that local storage again. Uh, we need to put it somewhere. We'll say var local storage. Um, sorry, var state equals. I got ahead of myself. Uh, local storage dot get uh, item async. We're going to cast it to a telleric or sorry a tile. Uh, layout state. So we're going to rehydrate the state. Uh, we make sure we cast it to the right type. And then we're going to put in the key that we saved it under, which is the index page uh, layout. Now, uh, when it renders for the first time, we'll go ahead and get the state. 
uh, we'll get it if the state is not null then we will set the state on that tile layout so I'll say tile layout dot set item or set state is state like that so uh, on after render async why is this not happy I don't have anything asynchronous happening I should this should be await so I'm gonna wait that local storage and then we'll set the state on the tile layout uh, this should all be good and we're saving it on reorder so now if I control F5 there's a couple lines of code not too bad not too bad at all um, now if I drag sales and I drop it at the end and I refresh the page sales st stayed put so now I can customize my menu um, notice the things are staying where they belong I can jumble them up as much as I want they stay put there we go we saved the state and again you can see a similar demo at demos.telerik.com just look under state persistence on the layout demo you'll find that there uh, I think that's it for me today I about demoed my all my demos that I can imagine uh, goal I love it uh, thanks uh, random random factor uh, thanks uh, thank you Eva thanks Sarah